never going in too much for the for the crazy new stuff, you know, the forward pacing sonar and everything. I, you know, I think it's kind of the job of of old anglers to poo poo some of that stuff. And, you know, it's just, it's just what you do when you get old. But um, my dad would tell me when I when I was just eating up with fishing tournaments. He said, you know, I think you you might be missing. Missing the whole point, really, of the sport, and I understood what he was saying. I knew he was right, but I was too consumed to change. Retro bassin, kicking some ass in wearing rayon jackets, thinking about bill dance, watching these fish prance through my Ray-Ban glasses. Ain't nothing better than forty-year-old lures coming off a of Zepco thirty-three. Bass boat making beer cans float, doing some trespassing. Fishing it old school, this old stuff rules. Welcome to Retro Bassing. If you follow this channel, you know that a big passion for me is shining a spotlight on places just like this. Those independent mom and pop style tackle shops that are unfortunately becoming fewer and fewer these days. I had been planning a trip to Gary's Tackle Box for some time, even before I moved to the Sunshine State. But last week I was talking to my buddy Ted Lincoln over at Ted Lincoln's Fishing Life, and he shared with me the news that after almost four decades in the tackle shop industry, Gary is retiring and closing the doors on Gary's Tackle Box forever. Needless to say, I put everything on hold and made sure I got to Gainesville as quick as I could, not only to meet Gary in person, but also to capture this place on film one last time. So join me as we head on inside. We're gonna meet Gary, meet the staff, and take a final look around Gary's Tackle Box. Cookie Watson, Charles Clark, Judy Clark, John Clark, me, and Ben Barron. That would have been 79, 80, somewhere in there. And then when we, we, we moved and went to Powers Park on Noonan's Lake, many years later, um, we left there in 01. And this was the crew, still Cookie, and still Judy, and still me, and... Gary and, uh, and Marty had come along a little later. The first tackle box, the second tackle box, this is the third incarnation of the tackle box. But you can see the first one was a general store. It was, it was a lot of fishing tackle, but it was everything else too. When I started, we sold nails by the pound and stove pipe and you know, all kinds of wild stuff. Remember the old wooden boats looked like stump knockers. Yeah, they leaned them up usually over on this side the way I remember. So yeah, I still have. I still got up. the picture of me and John Flowers. I wasn't that tall. Weighed my first ten pound bass in there. Really? Yep. Man. <laughs> well, Judy has an archive of all of the bass pictures we took, and there's four thousand and something. No kidding. And it is it, really an archive of Gainesville area fishing and the bass that were caught through time. And it's pretty amazing. Okay. Yeah. Remember old Jimmy Carr and all them guys? Oh heck yeah. I always yeah. called him the master. He was great. I used to paddle for him. He was really him. good. Well, yeah. he, I'm serious. I wasn't he, that tall. He was a I'd paddled legendary for guy in his day. Remember the old skulls? Yeah. I've got he, two of them still. Really? Yeah. I collect that kind of stuff, all that old stuff. They call it the Florida weed sneak. Oh. That you did yeah. like that yeah, little flapper on, thing. That old boat. Yeah. yeah, I've got two of them. His favorite lures, <clears throat> remember the old Dalton special? He was. And uh, 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 what was it, the spitterbait? Salad. Snagla salad. Yeah, the salad. With a chunk pork brown on it. <laughs> no, no, there's this one, the original one, um, was where 
Highway 26 behind us and 20 in front of us. It was in the fork. We were right in a fork of two major highways in the heart of East Gainesville. Dirt roads. Yeah, in the very early days. But we had parallel parking. We had parking in the back, parallel parking all around. Well, as time went on and the, the roads widened, they took our parking and we'd have people come and try to shop with us and we'd watch them. You know, they'd be pulling a boat and they'd go around the block three or four times. Finally, they'd give up and they'd drive on. We said, we can't stay here. We don't have any parking anymore. Uh, we, we outlived our parking. So we moved a, a few miles out east out to Powers Park on Noonan's Lake and into this building. And we were there for 10 years. We've yeah, been long. here for almost 13. So, and it's just about all, all come to the end here in one week. I grew up fishing Loch Luce and Orange, and so I, I, I really love Loch Luce a lot, but we got a real soft spot for Noonan's like Ted, you know, he, a, a lot of us that were around Rick as well, in the 70s and 80s when Noonan's was a destination for anglers all over the country. Uh, it was amazing, just amazing the fish it put out. Um, a lot of us really got attached to Noonan's during those years. And I still fish it more than any other place because it's close to my home. My bread and butter's just always been soft plastics, this variety of soft plastics. Uh, if I could only have one now to catch bass with, it'd be a zoom speed worm. You know, just be, run it fast, run it on the top, run it on the bottom, crawl it, do anything you want with it, and, and they'll always bite it. Uh, but I also love the Rapala, which turns out after all these years, it's supposed to be pronounced Rapala because the Rapala family pronounces their name Rapala, and they're the ones that get to say. But uh, we grew up calling them Rapalas. This fella, Charles, when the Rapala or Rapala first came out, they were hard to get and they were super expensive. They were $5 where every other lure was a dollar or two. And uh, we're talking about the, I don't know, maybe the earlier mid 60s. And uh, he said they were so scarce and in such demand that he rented Rapalas to anglers for a day. That's pretty amazing to me. I always love that story. How much did you rent them for? I don't remember. <laughs> I don't remember. Wow. <laughs> he told me, but I don't remember what, you know, what the, the rate was, maybe 50 or 80 cents. But that's a long time ago. There he is. Hey, this guy. Hey, fellas. <laughs> What's going on? You guys have met? Yes. What's up, buddy? Welcome to probably the person who's known me longer in Gainesville than anyone other than yeah, my mom. Yeah. It says he a used about to come in about that high with his dad. I was about six big, years old. Big stoic guy. And uh, he... He would, uh, he would buy Ted a, a lure or two, and it was great. And then I got old enough to ride my BMX bike to the shop, and I would spend mm -hmm. hours trying to spend my $5 a week on something. Yeah. Asking Gary a thousand questions. I had, in those days, I had three or four really young anglers like you, young yeah. guys, that were totally eaten up with it, and they would come in and hang out, and I, maybe I'd put them busy or... <laughs> uh, Something yeah. like that, and it was, you know, it's funny how that impacts them. Uh, one of them, For Kevin sure. Sheffield, was in the other day, and he was telling me all that. And he, you know, he told stories that I didn't remember, but, oh. you know. You know, we had cream yeah. scoundrels, and we had yeah. flip tails, and we had jelly worms. But when they came out with that curl tail uh, culprit, uh, the right, fish did, right, right here in in Central Florida, it just it just was the most popular and and crazy fish catcher ever, and they were they were very innovative. Like I said, they they were the first outfit that learned how to uh, pour laminates like red shad, blue shad, yellow shad. Nobody had ever seen anything like that. It's nothing now, but at the time, it really set us on our. Yeah, and on our head. Bass had like, man, that's sure. the coolest thing. And then we caught so many fish with culprits. Yeah. And, uh, and that particular color was always the one that I gravitated to, that brown and black color. Moccasin? Yeah. Yeah. 
And that's what you happened to have last time and caught his first fish with me on. Yeah. I we, have one tied on. I right had him right to this day, and I yeah. think the day before yesterday, somebody bought my last pack of moccasin culprits. Yeah, I almost thought about it when I came yeah. in, but yeah. I still got a few packs. So. Yeah, they made a lot of colors and a lot of great colors, and they still catch fish just as well as they ever did, but it's like the jelly worm. You know, you could go fishing with a man's jelly worm that we used in the mid-60s and do just fine. But for some reason, we put them in the rear view and go with all the cool new stuff. What well, help kept you, keep you in business for a little while. <laughs> That's right. Occupy. Everything has its season. I started writing when... Uh, Dick Bowles, who wrote A Pinch of Salt for the Gainesville Sun. You had this guy here, um, Frank Philpot, wrote all through the 60s and into the 70s. And then for a while, Tim wrote, and uh, Dick Bowles was a great writer, um, great composer. He's, he, he's an amazing man. And when he got pretty long in the tooth, um, I told him one day I, I thought I'd kind of like to write that column. And he looked a little surprised, you know, because he was just men a salesman, you know, a ta tackle shop employee. But I could write, you know, I, I was, I, I wasn't a men a salesman because that's all I could do. That's just where my heart was, you know. And it, it lasted a long time. There was one about my going to my first All-American in 1991. And that was when uh, Operation Bass would fly you there. But Delta Airlines, some baggage handler on Delta Airlines took, took my fishing tackle. So I'm, I'm arriving in Buffalo, New York, Lake Erie, for my biggest bass tournament of my life with no fishing tackle. So that was pretty interesting. Well, they made an announcement at the pre-tournament meeting. They said, well, you know, Gary Simpson here is, his, his fishing tackle hadn't arrived from Delta Airlines. It was me and my little daughter. And uh, does anybody have any, any spare tackle that they can lend him for the, for the tournament? And all of a sudden, 30 hands went up. And then after the meeting, they all scattered. <laughs> But I did find one rod and reel, and that's what I fished it with. Who used that picture? It's cool. Uh, let's see. 94. 94, yeah. My dad had that same shirt in 94. No kidding. <laughs> yeah, that's at home. Uh, my daughter's got three sons now, so. Two of the, two of the best Gainesville anglers from from the 50s, maybe into the 60s. Where were those two caught? It might be on the back, I don't think it is. Lake Kerr, how about that? So this guy probably thought he had the thing won, you know, but then Frank catches the 11 too and beats him. You have a 10-8 and you, you don't, don't have big bass, that feels pretty bad, eight, I imagine. Two, you get one oh, <laughs> that's one of those epic Gainesville fishing <laughs> beats, you know. All through the 70s and into the 80s, uh, the tackle box was a drop-off spot for, for uh, taxidermy fish to be sent to a fellow named Archie Phillips in Fairfield, Alabama. And these are all with the exception of the giant down there on the end, that's not a Phillips. But these, what, five are Archie Phillips mounts. And um, these were caught by two guys, uh, Guy Dennis, who was one of the greatest all-time football players for the Florida Gators, and uh, Bill Carter, who was also a real prominent Gainesville citizen. But he's just... Uh, just passed on, but somehow we ended up with his with the fish. Um, but yeah, these passed through the tackle box back in the day, and you can see the dates on them. They're all from uh, the late '60s into the mid '70s. And then you've got uh, the big one here is 13 and a half, um, and that's Porter Hall, who was a Gainesville angler, who was so devoted 
to the pursuit of a world record bass that he moved his family to California to catch one back in the day. And uh, I mean, he caught him up to 18 and a half, so he came close. But uh, yeah, he's, he's a pretty, pretty legendary guy. He let us have one of his fish. A yacht rod, probably a tuna rod from about 1970 with Milgram guides. It weighs <laughs> 10 pounds, probably 10 pounds. <laughs> yeah, it's a lot of rod. But you know, we try to keep old stuff like that laying around just, just for eye appeal. People really have enjoyed having feeling this rod just, just hefty. Oh Isn't that amazing? <laughs> that's about the heaviest thing I've ever had. That's, that's like one inch pipe. Look at that. That, 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 that feels like rebar almost. That is. I can't imagine hooking a fish that could bend that. Well, you don't even have a, a wheel on that. No. Can you imagine what that would be like if you actually put the yeah, a one national national on, there? Fit on there? Yeah, I've got a 16 on there, but yeah, little really things good. like that yeah, people really good. enjoy. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, we've all, always, uh, from the very start, offered reel and rod repair, which is something that is pretty hard to find. Well, I don't think we're going to continue too much with the reel repair, but our rod repair will continue. Uh, best rod man we've ever had is that guy right there, Rick Pena, of Rick's Rods, and he will continue to do rod repair for customers here in in, uh, in North Florida. So the one little thing will will survive us. Well, I've been here at this store for about eight years. Um, I started at the original tackle box back in the eighties. Um, started building rods for gator outdoorsmen in the 80s when we were building the original gator popping rod um i hadn't I didn't do any rod building or repairs until i started back here and then it, it progressed back into the custom rod business and um i don't know it's it can be overwhelming at sometimes i got a little over 700 rods out there fishing right now of uh, rick's rods brand um, and i do all the repairs here I do everything out of home, so uh, it's, it's just a little side gig that I enjoy doing. I hate to see it go, but I, I retired from the fire service after 34 years, so I understand wanting to retire and do something different, so I'm, I'm glad for these guys uh, moving on. And, uh, but tad, sad that the tackle box is closing. You know, it's, it is one of the few places that you can walk in and get some actual real advice, get your stuff fixed and repaired. Gary only carries stuff that he knows catches fish, you know, proven, uh, proven tackles. So, yeah, it's a sad, sad week. I'm going to miss the store. It's been a, not, not really a job. It's more of a camaraderie with the customer and the, and the product line. And it, it's really been a real experience. I've probably gained more knowledge in the past 14 years from customers in Gary than I had the previous 30 years that I fished. <laughs> it, was, it was really good. All good stuff. I'll never forget one of my first sales we had just gotten in <laughs> um, a big plano 777 tackle box and uh had a guy that was looking to buy i said well i'm gonna make a good sale here i'm gonna sell this plane big plano tackle box and uh sold it rung it up i was so proud of myself and then the manager at the time jerry stinson comes along and says well where's our order i said i don't know i sold that tackle box well they had packed the the lures that we bought and all the rest of the order inside that big old plane of 777. So this guy got a a totally packed huge tackle box for the price of just a tackle box, and that was one of my that was my first big sale. <laughs> and it was it was a big sale, but I didn't get much for it. So you know it, it all kind of went uphill from there. Well, we'll be here one more week. We'll be here till uh, November 22nd, which is the day before Thanksgiving. And I, I thought it would just be fitting that my first day of retirement after 48 years of this is Thanksgiving Day, because I'll be, I'll be given a lot of thanks. I think it's a truism that 
fishermen are kind of a, a little subgroup unto themselves, and they tend to be very, very wonderful people. Yeah. It's been great to get to know a whole lot of them, hundreds. And uh, these these last few weeks, you know, I've had scores and scores of them come in and you know sh share their memories and, and you know tell stories and everything. It's been really really humbling and very nice. Um, but yeah, definitely being around the sport in general is big time. But uh, it's been the people. Well, obviously, I got I got to stay in the boat. I got to stay fishing. Uh, I tell everybody I'm going to play with my grandsons. I plan to do a lot of that, but I'm sure I'll fish a lot more. I'm sure I'll, I'll you know, everywhere from Noonan's to you know, maybe even get back on Okeechobee or Seminole, a couple of my favorite lakes. And, uh, I, I fish less and less. I think that probably happens to us anyway but through the last few years. And uh, I hope to reverse that trend. Well, I've got a retro wagon we could have you out on. My, right. I don't have any uh, live scope, but I've got an old flasher. <laughs> That's fine. I don't use any of it. You know, I'll stick the rock tip down and see how deep it is. But no, I'm, you know, I, I, I love your, your retro bassing channel because I'm, that's me, you know, I am, I'm retro bass and that's what I am too. I've been collecting very avidly for, for decades and uh, I do, I've got a lot, you know, the, uh, I've got friends that have way more valuable collections and way, way less space taken up, but I just go wide and deep, you know, and, and people bring me a lot of things, and uh, I like it all. If it's old and it has to do with fishing, I collect it. I've got patches. I've got paddles. I've, there's, no, there's no category of old fishing stuff that I don't have a lot of. It's a funny thing, you know, we... we we tend to collect what we remember, and um, and for that reason, some of the really old classic baits, the early headings and the early, you know, gosh, there's so many turn of the century companies who have true antiques, really rare, really beautiful, that are. Enough to retire. Not avidly collected so anymore me, in favor we of really Whopper like Star, water, you know, something that people remember, you yeah, know, they can retire. identify with it. So I understand that, but, um, and I like it too, you know, I've, I've got Cordell's, I've got, you know, Mans, all of it. Because I'm with them, you know, I remember that stuff and I, I like it and I, I appreciate it, but. Yeah, that the really, really cool stuff, the, my very favorite of all awesome. stuff, is going to be um, uh, Florida Fish and Tackle Manufacturer, Eager Bait Company down in Bartow, Garland in Plant City, the uh, teens and 20s and 30s Florida manufacturers of lures. Um, those are like the ultimate for me. They're what I really like to find most times. Uh, Try to try to always try hard to find those, but there's not that many to be had. It's a very special case. Uh, Gainesville, downtown Gainesville, had a great, great bookstore going from the 20s and 30s forward called Mike's Bookstore. Uh, uh, Greek family bluesiotes, but it's a totally old, iconic bookstore. When they went out of business, a friend of mine ended up with the two uh, cases and I eventually got them from him. Um, and so it, it's old Gainesville history right there just in the case alone. early wooden tackle box. With just just as I found it. This guy was really cool. He he must have been an inventor, but he 
He has these lids glued, and he, you know, put his flies and bugs in there and, and just screw them up on there. That's how he kept his, his fly fishing baits. Uh, I've never seen that before or since. I, I think that was pretty smart. And, uh, you know, just a typical early wooden tackle box. A fellow named Joel Griner was protege of Jim Pfeffer. And he made, you know, that's his version of the banana lure. And he would come around to tackle shops and sell his baits in, uh, I don't know if I've got one, but in, in like, something like that with a header, with this header. Actually, it'd be like this with this header on it. And of course, that's not a grinder bait in there, but that was what it looked like. And I can remember him pulling up to the old tackle box in a station wagon and he had the back of the station wagon full of these lures and you just grab what you wanted and paid paid for them and put them up in stock and it was that kind of time you know things were things were very much old-fashioned at the time but you can see the pfeffer uh, influence here in the in the big hand painted gill marks and the bright colors and the dots and spots and everything. But uh, after after Jim died, I think maybe in 1980, um, Mr. Griner continued on making pfeffer type baits. Mr. Griffin made lures for the. Uh, participants in the Bill Branch Classic Bass Tournament in 19, what was it, 84. And so, I think somewhere on there, there's, there's a number, yeah. If you finish fourth place, you got one of these with 04 on it. So this is the only fourth place Bill Branch Chevrolet topwater lure um, by Sam Griffin in the world. <laughs> these these are all eager weedless Dillingers. It was uh, had a spinner thing here, and it, it you pull it through the weeds and everything. Wooden bait that fish like a spinner bait, I think. But it's a whole collection of uh, weedless Dillingers here, isn't it? This is um, Snook Minnow, Owsley Snook Minnow. Uh, in later years, an outfit maybe in Indiana took over Owsley's. He was a Florida guy and made these in plastic. This is Porter had a Daytona Porter Spin Man. That was a nice little topwater popper. And this is another boom bait. This, of course, is just your basic uh, uh, needlefish, boom needlefish. And then a Florida fishing tackle, Rehu, from Tampa. But yeah, it's just kind of a time capsule from 50s and 60s in Florida. Fishing it old school, this old stuff rules. Welcome to Retro Bass.